It's an honor to be here among so many dedicated clean energy activists and uh, people that have dedicated uh, their careers to the cause as well. And I know uh, I'm competing with uh, an esteemed guest in our country uh, right now, who, and I think there's an, a, an event tonight at the Alliance Center to, to uh, watch uh, the Pope's a speech and talk about it. So um, I'm sure there are quite a few people down there rather than here. But thanks everybody for coming and um, feel free to interrupt with questions uh, while I'm uh, going along here. I'm happy to, to take them as I'm going along. Um, Martin already uh, mentioned the organization. Um, we're now uh, getting close to 15 years old and been building up policies and programs in support of energy efficiency in, in all our states. After talking about Colorado, I have a few charts to show the progress in the region um, and show where kind of Colorado stacks up in, in terms of our energy efficiency efforts compared to these other states. I'm going to focus mainly on utility support for energy efficiency and what XL Energy uh, Piesco is, is doing and kind of see that as, as a, a key strategy. The, the utilities, XL and others, have invested a lot of money uh, in helping their customers save energy. It's, of course, not the only type of policy or program. Um, building codes are very important. Financial incentives, tax credits, what have you, can, can be important as well, education programs. But I, I really believe that utility support is, is critical for mobilizing and educating uh, homeowners, businesses, and, and, and stimulating more efficient energy use in a large scale. So that's, that's where I'm going to focus. So our um, key policies here in Colorado to advance utility support for greater energy efficiency, to get utilities to help their customers save energy so that they're not having to build as many power plants, not having to burn as, as much fossil fuel, um, and um, moving ahead with this sort of cost-effective resource. If we look at energy efficiency, saving kilowatt hours as an alternative to supplying kilowatt hours, it turns out it's a very cost-effective option. Um, as I'll mention later, about two cents a kilowatt hour is the average cost to the utility for supporting more efficient energy use, two cents per kilowatt hour saved. And so that's the lowest cost resource uh, for the utility. Uh, XL Public Service of Colorado wasn't doing a whole lot to help its customers save energy um, in the in the 90s um, through about 2005. Uh, we worked for six or seven years to try to pass legislation that would set up some savings requirements or savings goals. Uh, the utility opposed us. We had uh, Republican-led uh, legislature, often a Republican governor, back in the Governor Owens days, Bill Owens. So we weren't successful, but we kept at it. We learned a little bit every year. And by 2007, Bill Ritter was governor. The stars aligned. The legislature was supportive. And we got XL to come to the table and, and work with us on some consensus legislation this Law, uh, House Bill 07-1037 was the basic law that got adopted that required the Public Utility Commission to set energy savings goals for the utilities. We couldn't call them requirements working with the utility. They were just goals. And it also directed the co Utility Commission to give the utilities an opportunity to make a profit when they help their customers save energy. 
based on the performance of their programs. It wasn't automatic. It was, it was an opportunity, not a guarantee. If they really screwed up and implemented ineffective programs, wasted money, they're, they're, they're not going to earn a profit. So then it, things were handed over to the PUC, and, and they opened an investigation in a docket in 2008 to establish goals and the incentive mechanism. Utility made its proposal, and we and other parties made our proposals. We had a progressive utility commission back then with, with um, Ron Bins as the chair of the commission. Not too surprising, the goals proposed by Excel were not all that ambitious. They weren't zero, but, but you know, they weren't real real challenging. We, we put forward more challenging goals. We aimed high, they aimed low. We came out, I think, closer to our proposal than Excel's proposal. And so then in 2009, these goals started, along with this incentive mechanism. Um, so the, the uh, utility was motivated to, to meet or exceed the goals. As long as they did a good job running the programs, they get to recover the cost of the programs, dollar for dollar, in our rates. Uh, they're, they're not doing this out of the goodness of, of their heart. We have a surcharge on our utility bills to pay for these programs and our electric bill. It's, it's now about 3% of the total bill, um, paying, paying them to run these programs as the alternative to building expensive and polluting power plants. Uh, the goals get revised, reviewed and revised every three or four years. So we've had three rounds of Public Utility Commission review and approval of goals. We just finished the, the last round last year in 2014. Um, and the new commission under, under uh, Josh Appel is, is now the chair of the commission with Pam Patton and Glenn Vaught as the other commissioners. We no longer have as progressive a commission. Ron Bins is gone and Matt Baker are gone on the utility commission. But nonetheless, once again, Excel proposed low goals, cutting the goals out to 2020. We proposed continuing to ramp up the goals. And the commission came out somewhere in between, I think a little closer to our proposal than Excel's. Um, we were greatly helped when the uh, staff director of the, of the Utility Commission, a guy named Gene Camp, came forward at the hearing. He's a pretty conservative guy. I think he's an economist. And um, he got up in front of the commission and, and, and commented about Excel's goals. He said, you know, these guys are just crying wolf. They've, they've proposed low goals every year. The commission has set higher goals. They've exceeded their goals every year. and they're." And once again, they're crying wolf. And, and you know, I could say that, or Environment Colorado could say that, or the Sierra Club could say that, and, and, and it's expected. But when the conservative staff director said that, I think he had some impact on the commission. I was smiling, and the, and the Excel folks were, were not smiling when, when he said that. So we have goals 2015 through 2020 for saving 400 gigawatt hours a year. A gigawatt hour is a million kilowatt hours, 400 million kilowatt hours from their programs each year. That's their goal. The average household uses about 8,000 kilowatt hours per year. I'm sure not your households, but the average household is around 8,000. So that, that's equivalent to the electricity use of 50,000 households. Their go goal is to help their customers save the equivalent of the electricity use of 50,000 households every year. And if they meet that goal, they get the cost recovery and a bonus, this financial incentive, which is a flat amount, $5 million plus 5% of the net economic benefits of their programs. The bigger the net economic benefits for customers, the bigger their incentive. So they're incentivized to to meet the goal and exceed the goal and maximize the net benefits for customers. They're spending about 80 to $90 million on the electricity savings programs. They also have programs on the gas side. They're spending another $12 million, $13 million a year 
to help customers save natural gas. So they're, they're around $100 million a year total for their efficiency programs. And when they meet their goal, the incentive will be about 10 to 15 million. Um, assuming they meet their goal in 2015, they say they're on track to meet the goal in 2015, and we'll see. What they're doing, they have all kinds of different programs, lots of different rebate programs. You purchase sufficient lights, air conditioners, businesses upgrade their lighting, industries install um, more efficient motors, control systems, what have you. There's rebates, there's discounts on, in stores on, on compact fluorescent lamps and LED lamps. Excel's providing that discount. Technical assistance, um, they have home subsidized home energy assessments, energy assessments for businesses. They have the Saver Switch program. If you have central air conditioning, they'll put a, a device on it that will reduce the peak demand during the hottest hours of the year when their system is stressed. And I think they pay you $40 a year for allowing them to reduce your peak and helping them to cut the, the peak demand on the hottest uh, afternoons in the summer. They also have a program where they'll pick up an old refrigerator and recycle it to the maximum extent and give you like, I think $40 for turning it in. They're helping low-income households. Uh, they're supporting free weatherization of low-income households. If you're not low-income, they have uh, rebates for insulation and air sealing of, of your home. For small businesses, they have a nice sort of one-stop service where they'll, they have a contractor that'll come in, do the audit, make recommendations, help line up contractors, fill out the rebate application, make it super easy. All, all that small business person has to do is say yes and they can get a, a retrofit. They're also uh, educating consumers, they've started home energy reports. I think they're, they've ramped that up to about 500,000 households. They, they serve about 1.2 million households and I think about 200,000 businesses. But they're sending out these periodic reports that compare your energy use to your neighbors and give you a smile if you're doing well or a frown if you're not and tips on saving energy. Could interject something uh, more or less funny here. Um, our church here got such a report, and it said, you guys are horrible. You're the worst of the worst. Um, the fact is, we have ground source heating, uh, we have PV, uh, and many other measures. Um, and they failed uh, to account they, they, they counted our negative balance as a positive one and added it to our consumption. The same happened to Steve Stevens in the first row. Uh, we even uh, approached the CEO of Excel, uh, hoping to get this fixed, but um, I think the problem continues. I, I will mention that to the company that's running the program, Opower. I know their people quite well. and. If you want to give me a card, they may follow up with you, and hopefully, they'll they'll fix it. Correct. Right. This hundred million dollars a year to help their customers save money isn't coming out of the shareholders' pocket just as building a new power plant, you know, we'd all be paying for that. They, they've saved about 500 megawatts through these programs since 2009. They've avoided building a number of power plants. So yes, we're, we're paying, it's about 3% now. There's a surcharge, it's actually a line item in the bill if anybody reads. Fortunately, the bills are so complicated that very few people read them or understand them, but Unlike the power plant where there's no line item, for energy efficiency there's a line item. Uh, so you, you're, we're all paying uh, for these programs, uh, the, the cost of the programs plus this incentive if, the, if they meet, meet or exceed their goal. 
you still have to pay that surcharge if you're feeding into the grid? Six kilowatts in through my oh, it's it's um, <laughs> it's a it's per it's not a fixed amount. It's per kilowatt hour. So whatever I consume. It's th yeah three percent. If you have a tiny bill, okay. it's three percent of a tiny amount. Right. Okay. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. And you can still get rebates on energy efficient products and and discounts on LED light lamps at your you know big box stores. So just to kind of sum up what they've done since this new era of, of energy efficiency that started in 2009. Um, over, I guess, a six-year period, they've spent close to $400 million on their programs. The projected energy savings from all the measures installed over a six-year period by the end of 2014 was about 2 billion kilowatt hours per year, which is about 7% of their sales. Without these programs, their total sales, electricity use would be about 7% higher. Um, and this is, they have third party evaluators that evaluate their programs. They have to produce annual reports, uh, submit them to the PUC. The PUC can challenge their claims. The PUC determines if they deserve an incentive. The incentive is an automatic, they have, it has to be approved. They're looking at net savings, by the way, here. This is, taking into account an estimate of the people and the businesses that would have adopted these measures anyway. So the, the gross savings is like 3 billion kilowatt hours and their projections are, they have you know different adjustment factors program by program, but they're only assuming that maybe 60 or 70% of the compact fluorescent lamps that people are buying are because of their incentive and that a lot of them would have been bought anyway. So this is a kind of a net savings uh, minus the, the savings from so-called free riders. As I said, the if you look at how much they're spending and the estimated lifetime savings, it's about two cents per kilowatt hour saved. And, it, and the net economic benefits for customers as a result of these programs is something like a billion dollars. Uh, so it looks to be uh, quite cost effective um, and performing fairly well. They've exceeded their goals every year since 2009. The goals they said were much too high. Um, in reality, they, they've exceeded them. In most years, they underspend their budget. They have an approved budget. All but one year out of the last six years, they underspent their budget, and every year they've exceeded their goals. I mean, they, they've been supportive of doing these programs. They supported the law. Uh, when they have a, a shareholder incentive that kicks in when they reach their goal, if they only come in at 98 or 99 percent of their goal, their incentive is zero. Their shareholder incentive is zero. So it kind of motivates them to, to lowball the goals. And they know, you know, they're, they're facing me and some other folks that are going to make a good case for high goals. So we kind of play this game before the PUC. They propose low goals. We propose very high goals. And we come out somewhere in between. And where we come out is probably what they expected from the, from the beginning. So. Um. You know, we're all friends, and we shake hands and smile, and we go forward from there and work together. You know, we work together, and some of you know they they have an advisory group that meets four times a year, and they, and they take ideas and 
After the goals are set, they do uh, two-year plans for their programs. And they take a lot of input, take a lot of suggestions. And we don't fight over the plans. We always reach settlement agreements, if you understand the regulatory process, where they make adjustments. They take some of our ideas. They're willing to entertain changes. They work with the Energy Efficiency Business Coalition of Colorado. There's a, another nonprofit that's very active with them that represents energy efficiency businesses. They have like over 100 members. They're an intervener. We're an intervener. And we've always reached agreements on the, on the program plans. So they're one of, we work with seven or eight large utilities in the region. They're one of the easier utilities to work with, honestly. They're, it, you know, I'm not suggesting they're perfect. They're not perfect by any means, but the people running these programs are trying to do a good job, and I think they are doing a relatively good job as, as, as utilities go <laughs> with these programs. Here's uh, what they've spent each year on their electric programs. The bar on the left, they've grown from about $40 million a year to around 80 million, 75, 80 million in 2014. Their budget was like 85 million last year. I think they spent 78 million. Their budget this year is 95 million. They, they've increased the budget. They're moving out of promoting CFLs and doing a lot with LEDs, and that's more expensive savings. S supporting LEDs for the screw in LEDs, LEDs for commercial businesses. Uh, uh, they have a new program they're about to launch for LED street lighting, help their municipalities change out street lighting. Street lighting is a separate tariff, and we're now putting in place the new tariff. And it looks like they're going to offer municipalities, they own most of the street lights, and they're going to offer municipalities a lower rate for changing from the sodium vapor lamps to LED lamps and providing 50 to 60 percent electricity savings, 50 to 60 percent less electricity use. All the community has to do is say yes. And they'll pay less and stimulate energy savings in the street lights. They're going to do a fi five-year implementation. They can't do every community overnight. And, and I think there's going to be a a big queue, you know, who, who doesn't want a lower electricity bill and help support reduce electricity use and sustainability. So I think the, the, the battle's going to be about, you know, which community gets the, the LED street lights in year one and which community has to wait till year five. Um, question, has that issue been resolved um, that LEDs are not uh, warm enough? Uh, to work well when it's snow, when it's snow and ice. And regular lamps will heat up the lamps so much that all snow or ice melts off. And traffic lights. And traffic lights especially, that's what it's talking about. Yeah, I mean, all the traffic lights are LEDs by now. And we're talking about, you know, the street lights, the public illumination here. And, um, you know, they're covered fixtures. So I don't think there's snow buildup on the you know, cobra head fixtures. I observe please for the clean the ice off the track. Yeah. And if it's wind well and snow, you can have a red light covered up with snow and not see it. Yeah. Yeah. Um it's case by case. Every utility has its own set of, of programs. There's, there's one other investor-owned electric utility. There's only two in Colorado. Excel's the, the big dog. In Pueblo, there's um, a, a different utility called Black Hills Energy that has about 100,000 customers. They have their own uh, set of programs. They're required to to have goals, and they have an incentive mechanism and goals. They're not doing as much as Excel. 
Excel's savings are, are equal to about 1.3% of their sales each year, and Black Hills is about 1%. And we're just putting in place a new three-year plan for Black Hills that uh, Tomorrow morning is a hearing at the PUC on the, on the Black Hills plan. So the Black Hills and Excel account for a tad under 60% of the electricity use in Colorado. The other 40, 42% are a myriad of municipal utilities and rural co-ops. A lot of those rural co-ops get their power from Tri-State. The second biggest utility in the state is the Colorado Springs Municipal Utility. You have the Fort Collins Municipal Utility. You have this utility, IREA, here in the metro area, United Power, all the small utilities in the Western Slope, Eastern Plains. And they're not regulated by the PUC. We tried, after we got this law passed in 2007, we had a democratically controlled legislature and Governor Ritter, we tried to get some requirements on the munis and co-ops. In 2008, we came very close. We had a bill that passed in the House, and um, but we couldn't get it through the Senate. The, there was a lot of, you know, the, the, the co-ops and munis opposed it, and they cover a lot of geography, and there were some conservative se Democratic senators from rural areas who uh, wouldn't support the bill. And we tried again in 2009, and we, we didn't do as well as we did in 2008. So we don't have any state law calling for efficiency programs for the munis and co-ops. I'm going to talk. I have one chart here about what some of them are doing. How are, can I just ask about SB 252, is renewable energy that requires all the munis and co-ops right. to get a percentage. Right. So with that and your data, of how cost-effective it is, is there another chance for legislation? We're always trying, you know, we're always interested uh, here. You're right, of course, the renewable portfolio standard applies to all the utilities, and um, it was just doubled for the, for the co-ops to 20%. But we haven't been able to get, you know, efficiency requirements for, we haven't been as good p politically as the renewable advocates, and um, <laughs> we we definitely will keep trying. What does DSM stand for? DSM is demand side management. It's another term for these energy utility efficiency and load management programs. Sorry about that. Is there a proposal to do something with the disposal of the LED lights and the element that is harmful to the planet? The mercury and CFLs. Um, We're totally ignoring that I mean, I think a lot, a lot of stores or some stores, you know, have bins. Yeah. Because of the mercury in the in in, in the fluorescent lamps. Yeah. I just want to make one more comment. I, me I meant to make it here, and then we'll move on. Um, I think there are pretty, there's pretty definitive evidence showing that the amount of mercury that the coal plants are putting out is far more than the mercury that the CFL, the compact fluorescent lamp, is, is putting out if it isn't disposed properly. It's still a net benefit to put to use that CFL and not burn coal to produce electricity because the biggest source of mercury are these coal-fired power plants. And Steve's shake, shaking his head in agreement. So, I'm, and I'm not suggesting that we should not dispose fluorescent lamps properly. I, I understand what you're saying, and we'll try to give it more attention as 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 I as I continue to work on this. Oh, here's a comparison of Black Hills and Excel in terms of their annual savings. The line at the top is Excel. So um, we've been working on Black Hills. They're, you know, they've come up, and there's a new plan that's being heard at the PUC tomorrow uh, for their programs 2016 through 2018, and we're trying to move them up 
as well. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, anyhow, um, to mention some of the other utilities, uh, it's quite interesting. The, the leading utility in terms of their the performance of their energy efficiency programs, how much they're saving, is not Excel. It's the Fort Collins Municipal Utility. They have strong programs, and they're up around 1.8% net savings. Excel's at 1.3%. So uh, Fort Collins is showing that, that uh, more can be done with, with these programs. They've been at this level for the last three or four years, and they're the, they're the leading municipal utility in all our states and the leading utility in Colorado. Right. Well, I may be saying something wrong here, but it's not a uh, traditional investor owned utility. Right. They, they live to serve, not right. to skim off. Of right. <laughs> and, you know, and there's, there's other municipal utilities that aren't doing very much. Colorado Springs, they're spending three or four million dollars a year. If they were spending the equivalent of Fort Collins or Excel, they'd be spending 10 or 15 million a year. They're not making energy efficiency a priority. They're not making renewable energy a priority. So it's, it's not a given that a locally controlled utility is going to do a good job with this. You know, it, it requires the, the community to, to, to ask for it and the leaders, the decisions are made by the city council, they're the governing body of that utility and they have to decide to do it. But it, a small utility with, with the will to do it can do it. And you know, the tri-state and, and the REAs generally have minimum, minimal commitment to energy efficiency. They have a few million dollars a year on the part of tri-state, uh, some very limited rebates limited number of products, small amounts of money. Uh, so the, there's a great deal of, of, of growth potential with the efficiency programs the Tri-State and the Rural Electric Associations are implementing. Why, why are they so Tri-State is, is a very conservative utility that's you know fighting renewables tooth and nail, and they're resistant to energy efficiency. They just want to run those coal plants. They'd like to build a new coal plant. They've had plans to build a new coal plant in Kansas for years. Maybe they've given up on it now, uh, but uh, it's literally a, you know old boy leadership that's, that's uh, you know, not, not at all progressive and <laughs> fat old boy <laughs> leadership. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, the, you know, there are other, um, these are called generation and transmission co-ops. Tri-State owns generating plants and transmission lines. There's other ones in the country that are much more progressive. In Iowa, in uh, Minnesota, uh, that, that, that have good efficiency programs. It's just Tri-State's, you know, thinking like utilities thought 30, 40, 50 years ago. May I ask who in the state is responsible for the this information that needs to come to us so that the general populace can find out who is doing <coughs> Cedar Ridge Hall out? Who would be responsible? Who's responsible is going to the populace in rural Colorado and say, this is what your utility isn't doing. We have a state energy agency called the Colorado Energy Office, and uh, they could do more. To have that be mandated by the, either the governor or the legislature? Yeah, there's no mandates. I mean, they could go in and offer to help. They could co-fund. They have funding from the, from the legislature. They could co-fund some startup programs. In fact, they're doing some efficiency programs in rural Colorado with uh, dairy farms. They've had a program on dairy farms. I think they're extending it to irrigation. 
They have some interest in helping rural Colorado with energy efficiency, uh, but they could be doing more to to uh, nudge nudge the co-ops to, to implement better programs to nudge tri-state. But we need we need the legislature to to require it. Uh, is is the fact of the matter if if we really want them to do it. Uh, yeah. We depend on the local people to do it. We've got conservative folks in conservative areas and conservative co ops or conservative communities. Yeah. They're going to do anything that comes down from Boulder and Denver and Pickett County is going to be a social spot to take over their children. Yeah. Mine. We're going to do a new study from Berkeley. Yeah, right. right. Uh, Lance, I think you're just um, the latest member of our policy committee for press. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me wrap this up in a few more slides. I have um, two or three slides on the region. You can see, you know, 12, 15 years ago, we were a very backward region and investing very little in these utility efficiency programs. We've come a long way. It's about $400 million region-wide. We're over $100 million here in Colorado each year for these utility efficiency programs, most of that being Excel. This is a busy chart here, more colors than green, um, showing the first year savings each year for seven utilities. The, the purple line there in the middle, let's see if I, do I have a pointer? Ah, good, thank you. No. <laughs> yep. I'll point it right <laughs> So that's Excel. The purple line in the middle. The best utilities in our region in terms of the most savings, the utilities in Arizona. Arizona, of course, is a very red state, very conservative state. The uh, Utility Commission in Arizona is elected, not appointed, like here. It's a statewide election. These are you know, political people, statewide elections for the commission. They have five members. And uh, back, oh, five, six, seven years ago, the chair of the commission was a, a very progressive. We had five Republican members of the commission, but the chair was quite progressive. She had worked for Janet Napolitano, a Democratic governor. Napolitano helped her get on the commission. Her name is Chris Mays. She's a professor at Arizona State right now. But she grabbed on energy efficiency. She saw the economic value. Arizona back then was a high growth state. This was before the recession hit. And they were looking at you know billions and billions of dollars in new investment if they kept on the path of 4 or 5% load growth every year. They didn't know the recession was coming. And they said, we can bring that down and save billions of dollars by get going strong for efficiency. They passed requirements, not goals, requirements for energy savings programs for their investor-owned utilities, Arizona Public Service, Tucson Electric Power. And that led, you can see, the, the Arizona utilities really ramped up their programs and if you look at this metric of you know savings as a percent of sales, and you look at all the states in the country, the top states with these utility programs are in New England, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Vermont. After those states, the, num the top state in the country is not California, it's not Oregon, it's Arizona. There's a scorecard, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, ACEEE, has an energy efficiency scorecard ranking the states. This is one of the, uh, the uh, um, metrics that gets scored. And the last couple of years, the top state in the country, we're very proud of this, is Arizona. And, you know, and it's a great example that this, that this can work and make sense. And it's not just for the, the uh, progressive states. Sure. 
she, well, she managed to get a five to zero vote in support of these strong standards. It was a unanimous vote. The utilities got on board with it, and they're doing a good job with their programs. They also have some incentives, financial incentives for meeting their standards in addition to the standards. Um, we've built up a you know, energy efficiency business coalition in Arizona, too, that's behind these programs. And we've worked to bring um, some of the progressive f religious community, faith community, to support these programs in Arizona. Um, so the, the policy, you know, is there's been some challenges. More, last year, there were a couple of commissioners that that said, you know, maybe we should do away with this mandate, but there was enough momentum that we we fended that off, and the the ringleader left the commission, and his term was up at the end of last year, so I think we're in good shape again. How, how does SWEEP operate in terms of best practices and lessons learned? Yeah, we're, those we're always looking for best practice programs. We're helping the utilities innovate. We're bringing ideas for new programs. Excel's implementing a pilot program now with Wi-Fi enabled smart thermostats. Rebates, promoting those to see what kind of energy savings and peak to reduction uh, they're getting. They're implementing. We brought some ideas for programs that are focused on apartment buildings, because that was a kind of an underserved market. They have a pilot program now for multifamily housing, low income as well as non-low income multifamily. They're moving to midstream incentives for a lot of products to, to get their, um, the distributors stocking. They give the incentive directly to, to the distributor. So you're energy efficient, Rooftop air conditioner for s small commercial is not the special order item that you have to wait three weeks for, but it's but it's stocked and promoted by the distributors. This is often proven to be very effective in, in increasing the sales. So we're always bringing them, we're keeping track of what's going on around the country and bringing them, getting them best practice ideas, and they're fairly receptive to, to, to it, so. The programs are always changing every year. There's new elements in the programs. They don't talk about it. Uh, they have some stealth projects right now with the grow houses, the marijuana industry, where there's a lot of energy savings potential. <laughs> and um, they've given rebates. They've given quite a few rebates out. And they're, they're actually funding some agronomists to study the plant growth, the pl Productivity and plant quality, potency, with energy efficient lighting to prove to these growers who don't care that much about the high electric bills <laughs> that they can save energy and have equal or better product. And when they've, they've hired an agronomist, this isn't in their reports, but they're they're doing this, and uh, hopefully. It's very interesting. The apparently the sodium lamps that they use typically have a broad spectrum and are good for lots of plant varieties. And the LEDs have very narrow spectrums, and you have to kind of tailor your LED to different plant varieties. It's quite complicated, and you need different spectrum spectra during the growth cycle and the flowering cycle. And so they're trying to work all this out. And of course, LED manufacturers are all, you know, working on this, seeing a, you know, high market potential. <laughs> <laughs> the growth in savings coming from these programs, even the seven big utilities we work with, it's tripled in the last uh, seven years. And that excels in the middle there, the purple slice. So, so how did the last graph? Arizona imports a lot of its resources to generate electricity. Has this graph been equated to the overall economic benefit to the state for the 
Uh, yeah, we talk about that all the time. We don't talk about the CO2 emissions reductions in Arizona. We talk about the economic benefits. <laughs> dollars. Yeah, I, I just focused on the dollar side here in Colorado, but, but you know, I could produce the same charts for the dollar benefits in Arizona. Great, thanks. Yeah, and I have two, two great staff in Arizona that are you know, kicking butt in terms of building up these programs and maintaining the programs. Lots of business allies and other allies. You get, you know, ghostwrite op-eds for the papers that are, you know, the inter interfaith color and light reverends are signing and, you know, not, not the Sierra Club. Any questions? I wasn't going to say a lot more, but I'm happy to talk about it if you want. <laughs> That's the hard thing from a consumer. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the program, Excel's programs have been strong on electricity and fairly weak on gas. They're only spending about $12 million a year. The main gas utility in Utah, which is, has fewer customers and less sales, is spending $30 million a year in their gas programs. Quest our gas company. So we work a lot with them, and there's a lot can be done if you want to really push the incentives for, you know, weatherizing homes, high efficiency gas appliances, um, working with the cooking equipment and, you know, gas equipment in the, in the business sector. Um, Excel has been resisting increasing their gas programs. With gas, you don't have as much the, the arguments are a little harder because you're not avoiding power plants and big costs that everybody benefits from in the medium term or long term. It's really the direct participant benefits of using less gas and dollar savings over the lifetime of a high efficiency water heater or, or a furnace. Or, and so and environmental benefits, <coughs> and so we need, you know, I've been trying to get Excel to do more on the gas side, and they've been pushing back, and um, they're, not, they're not a leading utility in terms of the gas programs, unfortunately. Looking at the big picture, yeah. Colorado, energy needs, yeah. projecting all kinds of Yeah. So, and savings that are going on through programs like this. Right. Crisis. How many more power plants, etc., are planned, or are we actually doing enough to actually sustain yeah. the growth of business, residential, right. and what we've got? So, the, the combination of these programs, strengthening building codes, Tougher federal appliance standards. You know, we now have minimum efficiency requirements on over 50 products, from you know refrigerators to uh, vending machines. You know, all kinds of products, and that's had an effect in every state, including Colorado. So the load growth, you know, which used to be two, three percent a year in Colorado, is now I think. I know what it is for Excel. It's under 1% for Excel. It'd be close to zero if it wasn't for the marijuana. <laughs> they, they, they were projecting zero to a half percent load growth for the next 10, 15 years, and then legalization of marijuana came, came along. And last year, it moved up to 0.8%. You know, it, was, it wasn't 2%, but you know that might be kind of this one time. <laughs> spurt in, in electricity use. So ramping up these programs a bit more and extending them to the unis and co-ops if we can achieve that, I think you know we we can go without low growth. And then with growing solar and wind and renewables, the combination of 
eliminating the low growth. I mean, I'd love to get on a downward tra trajectory. In some, some states we are on a downward trajectory. In New Mexico we are. And, and other, you know, there are other states that but Colorado, people are still moving to Colorado. We have the economic growth and the population growth, so it's a little harder here. Um, but, you know, we need to you know, get to 30% and keep going up on renewables. I think that's the ticket to... I understand Austin Energy, typically, you know, they have a track record, they say, and they paint it. Um, and they say, look, we say 700 yep. megawatts, so we don't have to build coal. Right. Doug, I've seen them do public presentations where they say that, how many power plants they've avoided. Um, they're, they're not as vocal about it as, as a progressive utility like Fort Collins or Austin, the Austin Municipal Utility. For sure, they're not, you know, they're not. It's not, you know, page one. It's not in the first five pages of their annual report, let's put it that way. What they're doing to avoid building power plants, but they, they keep track of it, they talk about it. Our state officials could be saying more about it, our Ener Ener state energy office or the Public Utilities Commission. Um, I wanted to spend it just, I have two more slides sort of looking forward, okay, but I, I think, you know, if we can keep low growth flat, you know, there's a lot of beneficial electrification too, that, that electricity isn't bad. We have a transportation program at Sweep, Will Tour leads it, and we're strongly promoting electric vehicles. We see the, the best way to go is, is you know, to decarbonize transportation is not trying to decarbonize liquid fuel, but getting off of liquid, getting off of petroleum to electricity. As we green up our electricity, it's a lot easier to green, decarbonize and green up electricity than, than liquid fuel. And so we're out there. We've got a lot of laws adopted, tax credits and funding for public charging infrastructure and a whole, whole bunch of things. We're, we're out there leading, leading the charge, no pun intended. On, uh, electric vehicles um, and you know ground source heat pumps are, are can be extremely energy efficient and better for the environment and, and gas heating and, and um, air to air heat air to air refrigeration system or you know, air conditioner um, so factoring that in if we can keep low flat while we're doing some of this beneficial electrification and really ramp up renewables, you know, I think we can be moving CO2 emissions down 50% or more in the next 10 or 15 years where we need to go. How much are electric vehicles contributing to this load? It's still very small. It, it's like, I don't think it's like noticeable with an Excel's electric sales. Uh, I, I, Will Tour would know it. You know, it's some, it's zero point something percent of their sales are for electric vehicles, but I, I doubt it's zero point one yet. And you know, if if everyone had an electric vehicle, it would be something like a, a thirty percent increase in electricity, or something like that. I think it's not going to quadruple electricity use. So, um, in terms of the, some of the things that you know, I'd like to see get done, what we're recommending here going forward is you know, build on this foundation. Keep, you know, we want to keep ramping up the, the goals at the PUC. If we can't get tougher legislation, we'll have another review of the goals starting in 2017, probably ending in 2018. Establishing goals going forward. We need goals beyond 2020, and if possible, higher goals. You know, they, they met the goals. They could do. They could do more than the 400 gigawatt hours per year. If we have the opportunity at the legislature after the next election, if things the Senate flips back, um, it'd be great to get some requirements. 
on the, on the munis and co-ops. Uh, we certainly will work on that if, if there's any chance, you know, if there's a 2% chance of success, we'll be there working on it. We also want to try to uh, do some tweaks to the, the law that we have in the books now. For example, it doesn't require factoring in a cost on carbon in the cost effectiveness analysis. Excel has not put in a cost of carbon. You know, come on. It only requires goals through 2018. It doesn't prohibit goals beyond 2018, but only calls for goals for the first 10 years of legislation, and we're trying to get that extended for another 10 years. So I'm hoping that Excel will go along with me um, on, on some tweaks to this bill for this coming legislative session, even with the Republican Senate. Then there's a policy called decoupling that about 20, 25 states have. The idea is it's, it's a dramatic shift in how utility collects its money. Right now you have rates that are set making some assumption about what their sales are going to be. Once the rates are set, utility has an incentive to sell more electricity. They'll make more money when they sell more. It's a throughput incentive. The coupling says, in the rate case, you decide how much revenue they're entitled to. It's often done revenue per customer. And then it, as they go forward, they get that amount, no more, no less. If it's a really cool summer and they're not collecting enough, they get to collect a little more. But if they collect too much than what they're entitled to, there's a refund. It's, it's symmetric. There's a, there's a true up to their approved revenue per customer. And it takes away the throughput incentive. If they sell more, they're going to be given money back. That's what the company is. Decouple sales from their revenue. And utilities that are growing generally don't like this. <laughs> but utilities without much low growth generally accepted, and as I said, it's the policy in, in lots of states. Excel supported it in Minnesota, it was just adopted in Minnesota, the other big state where Excel operates in, and I believe they're about to propose it here in Colorado. I'm twisting their arm and pushing, it, pushing this, and I think we're going to see a proposal in the next couple of months to, to the PUC to get this approved. The PUC may be skeptical, we're going to need help in supporting this. But it will remove their inherent opposition to efficiency, to scaling up efficiency, and distributed renewables, which has the same effect of cutting their sales. They won't be harmed if thousands, tens of thousands of people put PV on their roofs, or participate in solar gardens. They won't be harmed. They might, they might even decide to support it, because it won't hurt their bottom line if this is adopted. So stay tuned. I'm a meeting with the Vice President for Rates and Regulation next Thursday to talk about this. and I believe she's going to tell me they're ready to, to go forward. So. Uh, did you say there's 25 already uh, doing this, or did I miss you? Yes, it's more common for gas utilities. We have this in, in Arizona for gas utilities, but not electric utilities. We have it in Utah for gas utilities, not electric utilities. I think about 18 states have it for electric utilities. California, quite a few other states for electric utilities, but, but like 25 for gas utilities. <laughs> what, one more, let me, let me just get to one more slide. This is my last slide. Um, so, we have this clean power plan, and uh, Colorado's going to submit a plan for how it's going to comply with these CO2 emissions requ reduction requirements, and we want to we see energy efficiency being you know, front and center in that plan. 
whether we go rate-based or mass-based, there's different options, but whatever way we go, doing more energy efficiency is going to help us get our CO2 emissions down. And so uh, we're, we're out there trying to convince the environmental officials that are responsible for Colorado's plan to, to insert energy efficiency in a significant way. And, and then, you know, in addition to the uh, utility programs, building codes for new construction and, and energy codes, we have some pretty outdated energy codes. Colorado is a home rule state. It's local governments that adopt these codes, not statewide requirements. Denver and Aurora are working on adoption of the 2015 International Energy Conservation Code. Uh, we should support that. Denver is most of the way through and Aurora is beginning, but Aurora is looking at it. And once Denver goes, we should get every jurisdiction, Golden and Arvada and Westminster, every jurisdiction in the metro area, give builders consistency and get on the, the latest code. Most jurisdictions are on the 2009 model code, and there's like 30% energy savings going from 2009 to 2015. Um, so that's significant. We have uh, quite a few cities around the country that now have mandatory energy performance benchmarking and disclosure policies, this Energy Star Portfolio Manager ratings of commercial buildings just to educate potential buyers, renters, you know, give them the information. Denver has a voluntary program. Lots of other cities have mandatory programs. Governor, uh, Mayor Hancock is not a big fan of mandates. You know, we have about, a, I don't know, 150 buildings that have done it through the voluntary approach and, you know, how many thousands of buildings are there? Um, so, be nice if Denver, you know, Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, Seattle, Austin, lots of other cities have mandatory benchmarking, and we ought to do it here as well. And then, you know, net zero buildings. This is where we need to go. And so there, there are a variety of policies that can help, education, training, recognition, financial incentives. There's can be moving the utilities to support this, and maybe some, some tax credits to support this to keep keep pushing for the, the cutting edge. Howard, um, got a question about nuclear power. Uh, that's been absent from tonight's conversation. Where's uh -huh. Colorado in the direction or in the you know fork in the road with uh, nuclear power? Um, I don't you know. Nobody talks about nuclear power in, in Colorado. We don't have any nuclear plants, and I don't think anybody's talking about any nuclear plants. The cost, you know, there's just so many better, less costly alternatives, whether it's efficiency or wind or, or solar. It's, what about you, Phil? I'm not the renewable energy expert. There are other people here that know more about that. You know. Ground source heat pumps are, are great, you know, in terms of geothermal power production. I don't think Colorado has great resources. Other states in the region, of course, Nevada is a leading state. Utah has resources, good geothermal resources. I don't, it's not my area of expertise, but I don't believe Colorado has much geothermal potential. But we sure have a lot of solar and wind potential.